Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 138 for Monday, October 30th, 2017. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in las gatas california i'm paul kent how you doing man i'm doing pretty good how are you doing i uh i'm good yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it's crazy you know we're recording this uh before the weekend we're actually recording on friday so uh you know it's in the middle of like a fridays are always crazy days for me so because we're dedicated right that's why we do what we do we love this too yeah, that's true. Yeah, man. So what's going on? Uh, I don't know that I have much to report. I'm pre- I'm prepping for a madhouse, which is going to be on Tuesday night, Halloween. Um, so that uh, that will be crazy because, you know, I got just got the song list this week. I know maybe half the songs, which isn't bad. Uh, have to learn the other half. And I think we're doing this one just like the last one, which was the Beatles one. I think we're doing it a hundred percent with the band, no tracks. Ooh. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, if we're going to be there, we might as well play, you know? So, you know, that's kind of like this petty thing that I, that I did. So, you know, we did it with one rehearsal, right? 20, 21 songs. Yeah. And I gave it, I mean, people really liked it. It was a lot of fun. Um, musically. I give it about a B. No, which is actually not bad for one rehearsal. I was just right? going to say, yeah, it, I, th- and the same thing's true. Of these madhouses, they're not, um, they're not polished uh, the way that they could be if we were, say, to rehearse for a week. You know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're gonna from the success of the first one, we got we booked two more, and so we're gonna like I was sharing last week, we're gonna do these two more, so you know as many people get a chance to see it as possible, and then we're gonna put it away. And then I think what I want to do is just make it an annual petty fest on yep. Petty's birthday, which I, I really like the idea of. And again, the music is so fun to play. Although for this next one. So one of the things we found about the last one is his songs are really short. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. So 21 songs went by in about 80 minutes and um, that's with me changing guitars and a couple things in between. So that, that's kind of funny, but um, so we're adding about six or seven more songs for the next one. Two of the ones we're adding are some of his biggest '80s hits. So don't come around here no more. And you got lucky. And I'm wondering if you've ever played either of those. Um, I don't. Yeah, I may have played "Don't Come Around Here No More." Um, I, in fact, I feel like I probably have, but definitely with a trigger not or or just straight on your kit. Oh, straight on the kit for sure. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of interested, uh, you know, those are very 80s sounding songs, both of them. And I'm right. kind of interested what with no rehearsal. I mean, we're going to have one rehearsal the day of the next event because I'm going to be gone mostly. And so the afternoon of the gig, we're going to you know set up at the venue and, and we're going to rehearse. And um, I'm really interested to see what people bring to that. that so that's, kinda, that's a lot like a madhouse where we set up and and rehearse either the day before or even the day of. Uh, I think on I don't think we're going to have a rehearsal on Monday. I'd carved out time just in case. But um, I think it's going to be it's a it's a gig. We we actually play. Well, it'll be one set, uh, 930 p.m. downbeat. And it and that's so that it can happen after the big Portsmouth, New Hampshire Halloween parade, which is this crazy thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. And uh, and then, you know, we'll do it afterwards, which is exactly what we did with Bitter Pill last year. We did an encore performance on Halloween or after the parade. And uh, so my guess is that we will be rehearsing this in the afternoon and certainly the evening while the parade's happening we'll be putting this together and then what's the uh, theme of the next madhouse the theme of this madhouse is uh well uh, let me let me find out actually i i can look i i just really just started putting it together so the theme is bonesy's birthday bash and the uh the origin story of the duchess uh, there are these these are two madhouse characters that that are sort of in every 
Uh, there's a there's a loose story that ties each of these madhouses together. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and and it did. It started with Bitter Pill. A lot of these characters were sort of generated um, in that, and then and then and and Bitter Pill sort of had a loose story to it. In fact, more than a loose story. You could you could actually follow a story, and then uh, and so there's there's these characters that that have have you know kind of evolved throughout the last year, and. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's what uh, that's what Madhouse becomes. That's why we don't re- reprise any of them. There was actually talk of reprising the Beatles one because um, because people really wanted, you know, the audience members really wanted to to see it again. And thankfully, perhaps I am unavailable for the November Madhouse, <laughs> which was which was the one where they were going to reprise. They're like, well, we can do it then. And they're like, but we can't do it without Dave. And they said, are you not in for that one? And I said, no, why? And they told me why. And I thought, yeah, maybe it's like, I, I'm definitely not available that night. And I'm like, eh, that's probably a good thing. Cause you know, it's, it's one thing. Let's move on. Maybe we do another one. That's, you know, all music from another artist. That's, that's popular. I was going to say equally as popular as the Beatles, but that's, I don't think, you know, that's, that's hard, hard to find. That's hard <laughs> to find. Yeah. But, but it's, it was obvious that people really liked having that kind of music there. So maybe, you know, more classic rock or, or do something uh, where, you know, maybe we do a sixties themed one and then, and we can throw some Beatles songs in, in addition to, you know, whatever else we do with the stones and, and yeah. some of that stuff. So, yeah. 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 So the reason I actually asked originally was uh, it's all about recreating those eighties sounds. It's just like, you know, you got lucky has it, real intense synth vibe to it. And obviously don't come around here no more has that whole sitar sounding thing and the triggered drums and stuff like that. But they go over just as well if you play them straight, don't they? I, I was just going to say it, it depends. This isn't true of every song, but but certainly most of those petty tunes, you know, they're their songs. Those songs are songs that could stand alone with just an acoustic guitar and a, yeah. and a vocal. Right. So when you've got that. Then it you, you it's sort of easy to to move things around as long as you stay true to the melody. I mean, I I, I think of many Beatles songs the same way. You know, a lot of people have changed Beatles songs up, and a lot of times it works as long as you keep those melodies the same and that chord structure sure. the same. You know, it's when people start thinking, "Oh, I'll change the melodies." It's like, really? You, you, <laughs> better you, than the Beatles? You huh? think you're better than McCartney and Lennon, huh? What? You know what? <laughs> More power to you. That's cool. Funny. <laughs> yeah. So I did have something fun to talk to you about today. I had an interesting conversation with a local musician here and the conversation was about, um, you know, approach to performing and the soundbite that came to that conversation that I want to talk to you about was, um, you know, he's a guy who's, you know, had a career. I think he's done well. And, and, um, you know, he, he does music and his, his, his words were, I don't do it for the money. I do it for the creative outlet. And this is something I've heard in, in many ways in different forms. Uh, and I think r- related to that, I think he said, unlike you, I don't do it for the money, which was kind of a funny thing because that's, huh. that's, that's not true. I don't think it was really technically a dig. I think it was more like he just really wanted me to know how dedicated he was to his creative pursuit, which I kind of get, but I'm also going to kind of call BS on it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I always say I'm not in it for the money, uh, but that that doesn't mean a that I don't care about the money. And, and B, as we've talked about, you know, the money can be a litmus test for whether a gig is actually going to be worthwhile to do or not. And I don't mind the money. I mean, it's it's great, you know, especially when I've got, you know, gigs with like Uptown that where, where the money actually moves the needle a little bit, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the thing about this, you know, approach, and again, I know a lot of people who are really like we say, we're all, you know, a large part of our audience is weekend warriors yep. and that type of stuff. And, you know, I might catch some flack from this, but again, it's not it's not about the money. Although although many people, it is about the money and that's totally OK if you this right. is how you put food on the table for your family. And this is that kind of like complex conversation about when you go into the endeavor of being a performing musician, um, remember there are X amount of gigs and there are Y amount of musicians and um, the concept of, of music having value money is one. It's one litmus for that. I mean, it, it, it almost never works out unless, you know, you're pretty, pretty famous, but I mean, if you take the amount of time you 
rehearse and practice and travel. You know, the, it, it's, it's really not about the money for most people who have a day job in that way. But my point to, you know, talking about money has always been that in order to, if you're going to be a, a, a working musician, we'll talk about professional musicians a little bit, but if you're going to be a working musician, you are part of uh, a market or you're part of um, you're part of a social group that is trying to establish value for services performed. Sure. Yeah. And, well, I, and I actually think that's the thing that needs to be held up to the light at all times. Yeah. And I I'm always respectful of the fact that in any band that I'm in, in any given gig with any band, there's most likely at least one person on stage with me, if not many, where the money from that gig is is important to them. And, yeah. you know, full disclosure, there are gigs where the, I'm that guy, too. Right. It's like, you know, what? I could use this money. It, you know, it's it's not just this particular gig isn't just, hey, you know, I'm out here having fun. Like I, I you know, I have plans for the money that I plan to earn this evening. And that never for, is far from my mind. It, like, yeah. even if I'm not that guy, there's somebody on stage that is and and or that girl, you know, um, or or who wants to be on the stage that you're on. Oh, that's a good point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very good point. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would also say this, 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 I don't do it for the money, you know, or, or I'm only doing it for, uh, are you, if you have that mentality, are you lowering the bar that since, you know, I will do it for less money or I'll do it just for a creative output. Are you not holding yourself to the same professional standard for performance that you would? Is it an out? Is it a cop out? And I actually kind of feel that it is. It, it can be. I mean, it depends. Again, it depends on how you take it and interpret that outwardly. Right. I mean, if I'm on stage and, I, you know, I'm playing a gig and that gig for me isn't about the money, that's fine. But I don't need anyone else in the room to know that. In fact, mm. I don't want anyone else in the room to be aware of that. Right. I want them to yeah. think that I'm on stage playing and putting everything out there, because frankly, especially if you're not in it for the money, why else do it if you're not really there pouring yourself into it and and making it appear as though this is the most important thing on my mind at this moment? And that's kind of my point in that it, as live music is a, is approaching the endangered species list. Right. You know, what is it that will keep it? Uh, the, the people who are doing it for hobby aren't the ones who are really going to sustain it on, on a local level. Do you agree with that? I do. And I'm going to pause this here and see if we can just clean up. If there's some little Skypey stuff going on. So hang on, folks. Weird that a new connection is what's needed and Skype can't figure itself out. Isn't that what Skype's supposed to do? Uh, it does. Yeah, it does. But we're back. So that's right. good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do. I, I, I mean, I think it's, yeah, the people that, that are out there communicating that and selling that message. But uh, it does, it, it dilutes the market. There's a professional responsibility once you're going to go into any kind of a commercial endeavor, right? So whether it's a little money or a lot of money, I mean, essentially now there's a big, you know, like I said, there's a, there's a responsibility to the, to the craft that you're representing if you go up there and you take any money at all. I mean, so if not go, you know, play in your garage, open up your garage, let people come by your house, go do a house party, you know, whatever that might be. But I mean, I just, that, that was something that just kind of stuck with me is that that philosophy is I don't do it for the money. I just think that that's um, a challenged, you know, perspective. I think, you know, for those who do it for the money and put in all that time, you lose one gig to the guy who doesn't do it for the money. And you're, you know, that's that's a challenge situation. It's not good for the marketplace. I mean, no. well, everybody, it, I, everybody should uphold the value of, of music as a service. That's it. And and, 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 I, and make it go up. I see it as if I'm going to be on stage and that musician that's not on stage with me knows that, I, you know, there's there's a chance or, or there's certain that Dave's playing this gig and he's not in this gig for the money. I'm going to play my ass off at that gig. So that the person that does happen to know that I'm not in it for the money doesn't feel any remorse about me being on that stage. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, but, you know, he deserves it. That's that's how I look at it. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. I think we're saying the same thing in two we different are, ways. Totally. It is that if you are going to take a stage, you are encumbered to do everything you can to reinforce the message that music has value. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, asking for remuneration, however that might be defined for that value is part of the deal. When you strap on an instrument, it's part of, it's part of the deal. It's not just about a creative pursuit. If you want a purely creative pursuit, do it on your own time. But remember, if you're going to take a stage that you're going to take a gig away from another one who puts food on his table for the, for that endeavor, uh, that's a responsibility that you have, you have willingly walked into by saying, yeah. I will take a public gig. Yeah. But there's some cats out there that don't, that aren't in it for the money. And that is, and I think this is where you're, you're, what you're speaking to. And that is their badge of honor. Like I'm, I don't want this to be a commercial endeavor for me. And they, and they, and there's frankly, they see it as a, it's a hang up, right. That, that these people have, I, I'm, I'm happy to call people out on this where it's like, well, I don't feel like I, I don't want to take the money for this because then that dilutes what I'm really here to do. Hmm. And, 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 and I mean, they feel as passionately about that as, as we do about this. And I, 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 I don't I don't want to deny anybody their passion, but I think that, frankly, is just a hang up. This is, you know, you, it's a cop out. It's a cop out. Yeah. Try it the other way. Correct. Like if someone was saying you're so wonderful, I want to give you a lot of money or give you a lot of something for your craft. Would they say no to it? Right. Yeah. And I think it, frankly, dilutes the market. And I see this not just in, you know, gigging bands. I see it in the theater world where there's people that that really, truly take pride in the fact that they're broke. Uh, and, and can't afford to do anything, but you know, my art, right. My art is this. And it's like, no, that's awful. Th like, that's so terrible for all the other people that are out there. But do you value your art? What do you, what value do you place on your art? Well, that's just it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you take that attitude, it means that you're, you're saying that art has no value. It, I mean, it, in a sense, right. I'm, yeah. uh, you're proud of the fact that, you're an artist and you make no money. It's like, well, that's actually really bad, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it doesn't I don't have get to it. be that way, right? It, so. No, it, that's a choice. I, I, and I, I, I've told this to people who are friends. I've told it to people who are no longer friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one most, one very recently, in fact, uh, it's kind of funny you brought this up, but, but um yeah, it, it's like, no, you're you're totally doing a disservice to whatever community you think or actually are a, a part of by by saying that, you know, being a broke artist is the only true way because it's it's the worst way. Now, now, this is different than someone who suffers for their art. That's different. Right. Well, so, but but see, I think it's a, it, it's the shortcut to being able to say that you suffer for your art. No, I think I think suffering for your art is someone who is willing to sacrifice all things, creature comforts, other income to to develop their art. But I don't think that someone who suffers for their art is someone who endemically will say, I'm not in it for the money. Right. I so saw I see well, these as two very, very different things. No, I, I agree with you. But the problem is there are people who are who want to say that want to show that they suffer for their art and therefore just say, oh, all I have to do is be broke and not make any money from my art. And there that like, that's my shortcut. Now I'm an artist. I suffer. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. Whether or not you're actually an artist is sort of irrelevant in, in that particular conversation. Um, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who I would very much define as artists that take that cop out, that take that shortcut. And it's like, no, yeah. you can, you can suffer. And I mean, we all have suffered. I, I, you know, I am fully aware that my businesses outside of music would be most likely far more successful if I didn't have music distracting me. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, and that's not a complaint. That's just a, an acknowledgement of like, you know, I would see my family more if I didn't have music distracting me. Like these are just facts and it's OK. And I don't mean to put my level of suffering higher than anyone else's. It just is where it is for me. Um, yeah. 
But it doesn't mean that I'm not out there. You know, I don't bang that particular drum when I'm on stage. It's not, so to speak. So to speak, right. That's not yeah. what it's about for me. Like, you don't need, if you came to see me play, you don't need to know that, you know, maybe on the set break, I'm a little sad because I'm not home with my family. Like, that is, if that's true, I might tell a friend or something, but maybe not even that because it's my choice to not be with my family and to be on stage instead. Yeah. Um, even though I know that if I'm not on stage, you know, for an extended period of time, I'm, you know, angsty and, and, and crotchety. And then my family doesn't like having me around. So <laughs> there's, there's a balance there, but I don't complain about that. Right. Uh, I don't think anybody listening to the show has ever heard me complain about it. I, I acknowledge it when it comes up, but that's that, you know, and you right. do the same right. thing. You're the same yep. way. Yeah. So a, a, a dotted line from this conversation about, you know, an artist, a starving artist, what's an artist. There was a really interesting conversation on our Facebook community page about what's a professional. Two interesting related but but separate conversations. And that conversation about what's a professional, we really should do it on, about what's an artist. But um, but what's a professional had such an interesting variety of, of responses to it. I offered mine was that what I what I see as a professional is the guy who is trained, practice, excellent at his craft, can walk, a professional musician can walk into any situation and play music. Yeah. That, that to me is what a professional is. A lot of people were saying, if you take money, you're a professional. That's kind of interesting. Well, that, that you know, is the, that's the, the, that's certainly the IRS's definition of a professional <laughs> musician. <laughs> but, but, but that is the classic definition of a professional anything. anything. Yeah. Right. So, I, I mean, so I, I grok that. And I certainly remember the first money I ever got for a church gig when I was a kid. I, I mean, I played a timpani for like 20 minutes and made 75 bucks on a Sunday morning. And I was like, first of all, I was like, Hey, 75 bucks. I was like 14 or something. I was like, that's awesome. And also it was like, Hey, now I'm a professional musician. Like that will never change. I've been yeah. paid and that's cool. But I did find it interesting that both you and I replied to this post and we'll put a link to this post in the show notes and stuff too. So you folks can find it at, uh, it's also in our group at, uh, Facebook, uh, gig gab, podcast.com slash Facebook. Uh, that'll link you right to our Facebook group. But uh, both you and I answered this question by essentially saying that we, neither one of us saw ourselves as professional musicians. Right. And, and most of the people replying uh, vehemently disagreed with, with, with our self-assessments. Yeah. I would say I'm a semi-professional musician. That's what I say too. Yeah. Cause it's not what I do full time. There was right. a period of time in my life where I did uh, music full time. And at that point, yeah, I mean, I was a pro musician and perhaps that's why I, I am not willing to say I'm a pro right now because I, I know, I know that there's another level that's way different than this. There were some really interesting friends of mine who weighed in on that on that thread who either have been full time professional musicians at parts of their life. There's one one guy who weighed in who's uh, who uh, plays on a very well known touring you know very popular band, um, and so it was kind of interesting that you know uh, their perspectives on it. Um, but it was all around the block about it. It was like if yeah. you take any money, right? It, you know, I, I was more focused on the training and chops that you can bring to any situation. That's kind of my perspective on, yep. you know, what a professional is because again, you know, like our friend who says he's not in it for the money, he's getting money. Is he a professional musician? Even if he's not in it for the money. Right. So. right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, for, it, it, with that definition, I would, I would take myself as a professional musician because I feel comfortable taking any gig. Uh, I'm not the best drummer for every gig necessarily, but I am capable of covering every gig. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident of that. Yeah. Um, one, one is an artistic definition yes. of professional and yes. one is a financial. If you, if you derive your primary income from being a musician, then you, you know, you can say you're a professional, I suppose. Yeah. And, and again, you know, there are guys in certain genres of music that can only play that genre of music, but they're certainly making enough money. Uh, they're you know, pros. Yeah. They're pros. Right. Yeah. yeah, John, yeah right. John Caballero had a good uh, definition. He said to me, being a professional musician means that making slash playing music is how you pay the bills. I guess I'd be more inclined to say that I was semi-pro back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that makes sense. Like, yeah. <laughs> if, is this your primary gig? Is this what you do? I think. Yeah. 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 So artistic definition, financial definition. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Both valid. 
I, totally valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I I had my own uh, response to this, uh, but I didn't find myself disagreeing with everyone. It was, oh yeah, okay, I right, no problem. And then it was like, oh yeah, okay, I get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like, there was no. You're wrong. And I don't think anybody felt that way. It was just really interesting. The only people that said anybody was wrong were the people that replied to you and me. <laughs> like, no, you're actually a pro. Right? <laughs> like Andy Dolphs, who came on the show, he's like, I would describe Dave as a professional drummer. To me, it's more about skill and trustworthiness. If he says, says he'll play a gig, he'll be there on time, ready to go, having learned his part. And most gigs, that's actually true of me. You know, some of these madhouse gigs, I might not know all my parts, but yeah. 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 And it was nice that you see comments like that for both of us, right? Where it's just like, hey, okay, good. You know, we're doing the so, things that matter to us. So to, to bring all these avenues together, if you perceive yourself a starving artist who's not in it for the money, can you also be d defined as a professional? <laughs> you know, I feel like that is an exercise for the listeners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Cool. All right, folks, let's wrap it up here. Paul, how do you feel about that? Good. We went through a lot. This was a high bandwidth episode here. Absolutely. Yeah. We're almost, we're, all, we're we're approaching three years of doing this. I know. I know. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. A lot of words. A lot, a lot, of, of, a lot of always be performing. A lot of always be performing. 138 of them. That's right. Feedback at gigapodcast.com. We've got some of your questions we're going to answer next time. So, Later, Dave. See you.